Hello and welcome to the No Easy Way Out podcast. My name is Tony Nash and we are coming to you as always from the armory in beautiful downtown Owasso, Michigan, home to my company, AZ Business Solutions, where we help grow your brand from A to Z. Now I'm joined today by a longtime friend and colleague, Casey Voss. Casey, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. Now, Casey, I think I met you for the first time uh, about four or five years ago at a BNI business networking event, and you were the president, and I came in kind of as a guest of somebody, I don't remember who, uh, and just kind of trying to feel it out and see what this was all about. I had been to several other networks, and I think I had been to other BNI groups, and honestly, I remember the first one I ever went to was really, really boring, um, but you were the president, you kind of stood up and made it very fun. Uh, you added your own little flair and personality to it. And I know I remember recognizing like this person is passionate about what she's doing. She's comfortable in her own skin. She's funny. She's easy to listen to. And so I think we talked for a few minutes afterwards and we just kind of hit it off. And we're not like, you know, besties. We don't hang out every weekend. But every time we see we each should. other, we should. Yeah, we would have a lot of fun. But nobody else would get a word in around us yeah. too. But no, I think every time we see each other, we always have good conversation mm-hmm. and kind of talk about what's going on. So it's always been a joy to be around you. So thank you for being on the show today. Ditto, and yeah. thanks for asking me. Yeah, it's our pleasure to have you. So why don't you tell our audience uh, what you're up to these days? So what I'm up to these days, well, I have three girls. Uh, one is a sophomore in college, and so I kind of am living vicariously through her, mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately, because it, I don't know if this is how you feel, but I am that age. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I in am my a mind? sophomore yeah, like, in college. That's exactly how so I feel. So awesome. And yeah. then I'm not. So yeah. I have that. And then I have a ninth grader and a fourth grader. So and I I'm do. also that age. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think probably you more so than yeah, I. But yeah, yes, yeah. I'm growing up. <laughs> yeah. Good um, for you. Yeah. Takes guys a little longer. Yeah, I agree. My husband's yeah. with you. Yeah. Good. So Good. Uh, I'm doing the mom thing, which I love. And uh, running city suites, which takes very little work, which is awesome. And then running my own little salon inside of there and I just got done well I don't know if you can call it got done I just wrote a book and um, I'm in the editing stages which I think probably for me could take two years (laughs) because I'm not a writer but I got called to something and it's pretty awesome how it's working well what's the title of your book are you allowed to share that Mm -hmm. yet okay so it's a big mystery so we'll stick around for that but I look forward to reading it I've always enjoyed listening to you speak so I'm sure that the writing will be great um, and I know you'll be your biggest critic, but I know that you're doing something that you feel you have, you know, been called to do. So be confident in that. And I know it will be great. It'll affect the right people. Thanks. So tell our audience a little bit about what is City Suite Salon and what is Bloom inside there? Okay. So for 15 years, my best friend and I owned a salon. We started at 20, a couple of kids with a dream to own a business that would shape ladies lives Mm -hmm. and uh, got into that and then saw this big thing happening east and west coast with salon suites and thought this is really super cool and as our vision had always been for Owasso why not Owasso why not bring something people have not seen here right and um, at the time we still owned a salon and we were a training salon so we leveled one through four and we just thought it would be a natural progression so inside of city suites it's a lot like your setup here Mm -hmm. 19 mini salons inside of this space they own their own business but they don't have to have all the space just one four walls that are yours your dream and we help you from a to z yeah in the salon industry how do you start a business what do you do how do i get a license what And we get that started so you can be successful. And three years into owning that, I was like, why are we doing this other thing? Like, this is so cool. And I can still be a part of the experience for women and men growing their business. But I can get out of the day-to-day struggle of, you have to come to work, Uh, honey, because you just got to. (laughs) And now I'm like... People that come want to be there. They right. own it. It's exactly. theirs. It's their thing. And so that's they have some skin really in the game. fun. So it's kind of like an incubator in yep. a sense for salons, stylists, nail technicians, everything. Yeah, we have I, a therapist in there. Yeah, I think it's cool because my daughter, uh, last year was her senior year, and she had her big senior banquet. You know, we go to Christian schools so and do prom. 
Um, she Footloose. had her, yeah, she, exactly. No dancing <laughs> this side of the county line. Um, so we took her there and she was able to go in in one place. I got to drop her off at like nine in the morning and they told me to come back at like two or three. I'm like, how in the world can you spend five hours on one person? But they did. And she got her hair done and her makeup done and her nails done, her pedicure. She got a spray tan. I mean, everything in one place got to do it all. A couple of different places. She got to meet different business owners. I thought that was really cool and unique, and it's it's cool that our town has something like that. So now in your salon, yours is called Bloom. You yep. do primarily hair. Yep, I do only hair. I specialize in curly hair. Yes, um, you got a few curls of your own. If you're seeing me, it is yeah. my life. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, I specialize in curly hair, and I really focus on the ladies. So that's where you came up with the the handle on Instagram, Voss the Curl Boss. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. So um, having owned a big salon for many years, I had a social media girl who was the whip. Yeah. And if you looked <laughs> at our previous, so I owned Hairpiece and then Smith & Voss, and those pages were legit. Yeah. And so when we decided to close, literally my biggest fear was, I have no idea how to use the internet. <laughs> and so Whitney said, um, you're going to have to have a handle. And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> and so I'm like, what can I do? And I'm like, what about Voss the Curl Boss? And I came to work the next day and everyone in the salon was making fun of me. They're like, yeah. that is cheesy. And you know what? It really but has it's been it's awesome. who I am. Yeah. And it's been a really, now they all are laughing because it really is yeah. easy to remember. It's a Dale yeah. Carnegie strategy. Yeah. Rhyme your name to what you do. Right. And it is who I am. So yeah. easy to find. Yeah. And the truth. I, I used to have gatherings uh, when I was in college, and I would call them a Nash Bash. And everybody, you know, wanted, wanted to come to the Nash yeah, Bash. Yeah, they do. They weren't even that great, but the name was compelling. Yeah. So, well, another way that we kind of interacted, I don't know if you remember this, but years ago, they had open mic nights at Guido's. Oh, God. And uh, I had went one time to see Maddie Hartz and sing, and I saw a comedian get up, and the poor kid just struggled. I mean, like... Like, and one of the things on my bucket list was always to do, literally, I have it written down, do stand-up comedy at an open mic night. Now I was picturing, like, a comedy club, but this is a small little coffee mm-hmm. shop. I thought, hey. So I signed up to do it, and I think they give you three minutes, and I went, like, 12 minutes or 15, I don't remember. But I saw that you were signed up after I got there or something the same night, and I was like, oh, man, she's going to kill me. But we both did it the same night. It was a fun experience. I wouldn't say that I killed it. I wouldn't say that I bombed. It was just kind of, but it was really fun. Do you remember that? I do remember that. Have you done any other stand-up comedy? Heck no. That was a one and done. And it's so fun. You can find it it on YouTube if you want to watch it. See, I wish I would have recorded mine. I don't have mine recorded anywhere. Yeah. And I had never done anything like that, but everyone kept saying you should. And I tried it and it was so fun. But what happened after that is I got asked to do stand-up comedy at every <laughs> charity event in Owasso. Like impromptu or like planned? People, people just kept calling me. Like, you were so funny. Can you? You're not, That's way too much pressure. Yeah. Being funny. So I always say I'm a storyteller. Right. That happens. To, my life is legitimately hilarious. Right. Horrible incidences one after another and right. I share them right and that's what's funny but to say jokes uh, yeah. I'm like you can't to write no. jokes ahead. Yeah. Yeah. that was why I found the hard work because I can be like funny on the spot yeah. or when I'm telling a story but like to try to plant that was the hard part but yeah it was a good time now you said it's on YouTube it is Zach put this on the video oh, Where, what's it called on YouTube I want people to look this up um there's three different videos because at the time I didn't know how to load them yeah. and so <laughs> I think you have to I don't even know if you have to search Casey Voss or Voss Casey but it's the fall of man um why are my bones so big yeah. and there's one other one I don't remember we'll find it we'll find it we'll I don't it. look like this in that video, you're about though. to get three new hits just just Boom. because of this we're gonna, we're gonna blow it up for you <laughs> <laughs> okay don't so, ask me to do any comedy <laughs> all right so now I want to do something we do on the show called this or that this oh. is to give our audience a little chance to get to know a little bit about you personality profile if you will but we're gonna give you a couple of this or that options and you tell us which one does Casey Voss subscribe to okay are you ready yeah okay Apple or Android? Apple. Action or chick flick? Chick flick. Night owl or early bird? Early bird. Countryside or city slicker? In the middle. <laughs> Seinfeld or The Office? Seinfeld. That's a good answer. I, love, I don't get very many people to answer Seinfeld, but I love it. I don't get The Office at all. Yeah. Don't get it. I, I enjoy The Office. I have a Michael Scott quote on my wall, but Seinfeld is just classic. Facebook or Instagram? Uh, Instagram. All right. Good movie or good book? Book. Dog or cat? Eh. Either, I have a dog. 
<laughs> Neither. All right. Phone call or text? Phone call. Passenger or driver? If you ask my husband, it would be passenger driver. <laughs> <laughs> Backseat driver. <laughs> there it is. Yes. Right. Money or time? Time. Save or spend? Save. Night in or night out? In. All right. This is the big one. Wolverines or Spartans? Neither. Have never seen. Do not know. <laughs> wow. No dog in the fight. Yeah. No dog in the nothing. fight. Okay. So you are basically Switzerland on this one. You're just yeah, well, whatever. Nothing. Okay. I got all right. nothing. That's all right. Hey. You'll, everybody if it's will, color. Everybody will love I you. I like green and white. Oh, you do? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. We can go with that. All right. So let's get into talking a little bit about your journey. Okay. okay. You have, for, I've heard some of it. I've heard something you kind of alluded to a little bit of it, but let's talk about kind of, we don't necessarily have to go back to birth unless you want to, but let's talk about Casey Voss's journey and how you got to where you are today. From my opinion, you know, you are one of the more successful entrepreneurs in our community. You've not just done it once, but you've done it a couple of times and kind of reinvented your thing. And so I'll let you kind of tell the details. But let's give our audience a chance to look at, you know, through the eyes of you, what your journey was like and how you got to where you're at today. Sure. So I'll try and do that as quickly as possible. Well, one, of on. the, one of the biggest things that I think is important is for some people, passion doesn't just happen. Right. You don't always know. Like I spoke with Mandy Pydeck at a women's event one time and her story was like, I knew from the time I was little and all these things that I'm listening to her. Yeah. And I, I never had that. Right. I grew up um, without any self-confidence. I was completely vulnerable and insecure and would have chameleonized myself in any room to be what you needed me to be. Right. And failed out of high school and ended up in beauty school, head shaved, face pierced, blue hair, angry at the world. Um, I think it might have been black because Kurt Cobain died, so I had sure. to like go in morning. morning. Yeah. There was a season. <laughs> um, and they said, we have to figure out how to get you out of school. And they asked me about beauty school and I legitimately started foaming at the mouth and said, have you seen me? <laughs> and they said, well, you get out at 11 for the next two years and you don't have to go on Monday. And I said, this isn't skipping. Right. <laughs> and they're like, no. And so I went. What's the, what's the trick? Yeah. Like, okay. Um, so I went and I w I'll be honest for a long time. I thought I don't belong here. I really don't belong anywhere. And then one day, no joke, I was doing a client. And I turned her around and I saw the moment that she saw herself mm -hmm. and that she saw something I had brought out in her that I had no idea how to bring out in myself. Mm -hmm. This, this moment, and I was too hard at the time to say it, but I knew, I knew that being able to uncover what women hide and allowing them to see themselves as beautiful was so powerful to me because I did not, was not able to see that in myself. And mm. that kind of birthed, like, this is my thing. This is my jam. I'm going <laughs> to do some hair. Yeah. And uh, that was it. That's where yeah. it went. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, out of that came, uh, I had a baby at 19, worked at a salon in town with my best friend. And we were so wild that our boss was like, you cannot work together anymore. Put us on separate shifts. And so she said, we're going to open our own shop. Yeah. We're to show her. And I'm like, yeah, let's do that. And then I got pregnant at 19 and I thought, I'm not doing anything. Yeah. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to make this solid hundred a week and, you know, raise a human yeah. uh, with my husband, who was not my husband at the time, but he is now. And Jamie opened the salon and later, probably about a year down the road, she kept saying, come with me. Let's yeah. do this. Yeah. So. We did two girls in a shop about the size of this room with a space heater because there was no heat. We started doing hair and living. What was the that dream. called? Hairpiece. Hairpiece. I remember hairpiece. Yeah. yeah. And we had two nail techs and Jamie and I, and that was all I ever wanted. It was all I ever wanted. And then another business owner approached us and said, we're redoing this building. Do you guys want to expand? And I said, no, because I was still the girl with no confidence. Right no security. And Jamie's like, I think this is God opening this door. I'm like, well, he's going to have to pull me because I'm yeah. real good over here with right. the space heater. So, <laughs> uh, we expanded it doubles as a hairdryer. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> we did it. We had a kid get burnt on it, that kind of space heater. So we grew the salon there, expanded, had a fire there and lost everything. And I learned I, so many valuable lessons 
because my ego was a little big at that space. Like we had grown, we now had 14 girls, we were doing it. And when you lose all your stuff, but your people are still there, yeah, you kind of realize, oh shoot, it's not about my stuff. Mm -hmm. So first lesson, 24-ish, I think. And it was awesome. And we rebuilt and ended up at Woodard Station. Which is an awesome space. So awesome. awesome we space, were the yeah. first business in there, uh, tripled in size to that space and grew at one point had 30 employees there. Wow. Not employees. They were um, subcontractors. So they yep. rented and we were, we won a national award for salon design, uh, third runner up in the nation. I mean, just so many blessings. Yeah. And in the middle of all that, uh, we lost everyone. So now I I'm posed with, I have, already learned that it's about the people not the stuff right and now i have this national award for my stuff and no people right and woo boy that'll do you in and yeah. so here i am sitting in this space and jamie and i had proposed we felt like our business had grown but it was not growing in the direction we wanted and so we actually had the idea to build suites there and presented it to our team and said hey those of you that are ready, you're going to move next door. We were going to build suites next door. Mm -hmm. And those of you that aren't, we're going to transition. This is going to be great. We're going to grow. But we wanted to have a vision. And sometimes when you have people that are all subleasing space, right. you can't control the vision. And I don't want to own something that isn't what my dream was. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. The business can take you. The business by itself can become something that you never intended. Yeah. It. And we've gone through that evolution here where you offer these services and all of a sudden it gets away from you. Now you find yourself, I'm doing something that I never really set out to do. So just, you know, I have this big poster behind me, this big canvas that says, remember why you started. That's very big to me to always remember why did I start doing this in the first place? My, my why was never to get rich. And so I have a very specific why. And so I want to always remi remember that so that I am in this journey of entrepreneurship and being a father and a husband and all of these things that I do remember what I did this for originally so that you don't become the business the business kind of is an extension of you so yeah yeah that's so good I didn't have those tools yeah. I started at 20 and I thought what did matter yeah was how you looked yeah. how big it was what it looked like if people thought you were cool I mean my ego was just going and I didn't even know it existed I, right. I just thought this was it God was blessing me the world was on my side mm -hmm. and uh when you realize that people will do what is best for them, which is not wrong, mm -hmm. it is not wrong, uh, that will check you again. For sure. And I wondered for a long time, had we not heard God, because we really believed that God had shown us the vision for the suites, that the dream was there, um, that the people would follow. We had built a culture and a brand. And within a year, it was actually six months, everyone left, seven first, then two, then two, then mm. two. And did they just go start their own thing or just went to a different so place? Another salon opened for them and they could oh, all stay together. And they thought, and I get that yeah. someone offered, you're going to have the same exact thing over here you had here. But we all know that that's never how that works for because, sure. um, but what I was left with was I'm a failure that ki kind of came back. Mm -hmm. And that was what I had been running from mm -hmm. since all the goodness quote unquote started yeah everybody look at me i'm doing so good and everyone was telling me how good we were doing and i mean it was evident i had all these women working for me and and then it wasn't so good and i was a mess mm -hmm. for a solid year i didn't go to the store i was t i was afraid for my life in so many senses and it seems so weird but during that time there was a ad on the front page of the paper it went out and it said nearly 25 women leave local area salon. It was front page news. Oh my goodness. And you think that's not a big deal till it's your life. Yeah. And it's a little town with little right. people, you think. Right. But we still my have a people. newspaper, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's that's, my town. Yeah. It's my story. For sure. And I was just so overwhelmed with failure and then thinking all these people see me that way. Mm -hmm. And I had to really soul search, like, and Jamie and I together. We said, do we believe that God said? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we actually won the award for salon design uh, the day our last person quit. We got the, we got the call oh, from the magazine, and the title was Salon of the Nation. And all I could remember hearing was that song, that uh, God of the Nation. Yeah. And I just started remembering, because that's what he calls us to do, mm-hmm. what's happening in the supernatural mm-hmm. sometimes is not what it looks like in the natural. And so for am sure. I going to trust in what I see, or am I going to trust in who I know? Mm. Am I going to trust what he's called me to do and I'm going to move on and for a long time I I wasn't quite sure but we kept going to work and then we interviewed one girl this is so cool uh the first girl we we had set up the interview before the last girl quit and when the last girl quit I thought this is it like (laughs) God is clearly never mind yeah and uh she showed up and Jamie said we're still going to do the interview she was so much stronger than me and I said well I don't even know what to say to her so I said when she sat down what what are you looking for in a job? <laughs> and she said, I hope this doesn't sound weird. And she's looking around. She said, but I, all I ever wanted was to work in a place with Christian owners. And I hope it's not cheesy, but I always liked brick walls. <laughs> and I just started falling check, check, check. Because yeah. I'm like, that's all I have. Right. And that was it. And thus, wow. so we changed the name. We moved. We closed that down. Gave up the ego in the middle of it. Like, I don't need the national award. I get it, God. Right. I got to be happy with me. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. This isn't what it is. So closed it. Opened. Changed the name. Structure. Moved back downtown where we started. Mm-hmm. Where we thought it was supposed to be. And changed the name to Smith & Voss. Mm-hmm. Um, with a crown at the top. Because God was our head. Yeah. And that was it. So rolled that out. And then... Five years into that, opened City Suites. The vision that God gave us seven years before that, that failed. Now bigger and better. We had planned seven. We have 19. You know, his plans are not ours. So He he can give us a vision, but a lot of times he knows there's a progression to get us to the point where we can actually handle it. Yeah, and it's got to be about him. Yeah, and I think patience is a huge key in understanding that having a vision for something is important so you know where you're headed having that why and know that you're working towards something. Um, but then being patient that it could take time and it could take failure, but even failure is part of the journey and, and it's part of the lesson and it's part of God's plan and it's to strengthen us and to stretch us and to increase our capacity so that we can handle what's next. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people get lost in the failure or get lost in the setbacks or get lost in the, the difficulties and they think it's too hard Mm -hmm. and they quit and they and i think the reason people quit is because they don't have that vision Mm -hmm. they don't trust that there's something different ahead Mm -hmm. and even when you do don't get me wrong even when you have that vision those tough days or tough weeks or tough seasons can really make you feel like i mean if i'm being transparent i just had a day last week probably for the first time since i started And I literally felt like, I just, I don't want to do this anymore. I just wanted to quit. I had a bad day. Just Mm -hmm. bad things happen. And and in the whole scheme of everything, it probably wasn't as bad Mm -hmm. as I felt like in me. But you just get feeling like that sometimes. And you just kind of dust yourself off and push through it. But in your situation, I mean, what a contrast to see like national award from the outside looking in perception is business is good. Things are awesome. But then you on the inside are having these internal struggles and you see that, yeah, I won this national award, but locally here, my business is in a Nothing. really weird mm. transition and maybe failing. And again, I think failure is subjective. I think failure is uh, is only failure if it's final, if you allow it to define you. Mm-hmm. But, you know, getting back up is not necessarily a failure. It's just a setback as long as you keep pushing through it. It's a transition. But Everything yeah. is transitioning from one thing to the other, whether right. we want it to or not. So right. accepting it. Right and being adaptable right and this is something i'm trying to teach my children because you Mm -hmm. know i have my two oldest sons they're really big into sports right now Uh, they love basketball but both of them will have a night or they'll go play in a game and they'll just have a terrible game and they're just like uh, my son just recently one of my sons he had just just a horrible night he played bad just really bad and it happens even to pros but he just said i guess i'm just not a basketball player I guess it just wasn't meant to play basketball. Mm-hmm. And I'm cool. like, son, you can't quit because of one bad night. Mm-hmm. Practice. You know, when you have a bad day, you have a difficult time, let that inspire you to get better and get stronger. What do I need to learn from this? What made my weaknesses so exposed? What put me in that position? 
and I think that I see a lot of young people particularly. And you started when you were 20, uh, so you had this whole ego that you didn't even realize you had, which is very common for people of that age. And I think that one of the reasons I started this podcast, you know, is I, if you look on our, on our website, it says avoiding shortcuts, overcoming setbacks, achieving success in that progression. Like Boom. forget the shortcuts, do that, do the, do, do the, the hard work. stuff, put the work in and overcome those setbacks. They're going to be there. You're going to have them They're And they might be big ones. I mean, they might feel like life ending day ending week ending year ending i mean life altering things but just push through those things and you're not going to achieve success till you do those things and so i want to encourage anybody listening out there that when you're in that season of difficulty and sometimes difficulty can be a day it can be a week but sometimes it can be a whole season it can be like this and is happening mine was five five years yeah. of uphill trusting and the same as you I just told my daughter she had her first C her first semester in college first C I think <laughs> in her life wow and she called me same thing I I can't do it all I I'm failing and I said Sydney sometimes the C is right. exactly what you need it's right. not staring at the C right. and trying to make it an A mm -hmm. it's looking at the C and saying what yeah. in this is my weakness how can I grow in this or how can I just accept that some things I'm not gonna you don't want to be the bomb at everything right that's annoying well exactly that's nobody annoying. likes to know it all yeah, like <laughs> or do it all back it up yeah yeah well, no, I mean I, you know keep going back to our children but I think there's so many life lessons in being a parent you learn a lot about yourself by mm -hmm. being a parent but my daughter just went to her freshman year of school and she loves volleyball and she joined a collegiate or some schools call it a fraternity and they have these intercollegiate sports she tried out for the volleyball team. Now, she's a freshman. A volleyball team can only take, like, 10 girls. There were six returning players. So out of all the people, you know, they were going to pick four. And she didn't make it. And her response on the via text was, well, I guess I just not meant to play volleyball. Same response my son gave. And I said, well, maybe God just wants you to focus on your schooling this year. You're a freshman. A lot of freshmen don't make it. And I said, work hard this year and come back and try next year. She said, I don't know. I just don't know if it's for me. And I said, well, listen, if you quit volleyball, Quit volleyball because you have a different vision for your life and it's just not part of it, but not because you think you failed this one mm -hmm. tryout, you know? And I think that's so key. Like there are times to close up shop and move on. Like it didn't work. It was mm -hmm. just part of it. But then there are times that, that, that you're being tested or tried mm -hmm. to try to purify you, to try to get that next level of strength. And I think that, and it's not just young people, it's people of all ages, but you see young people particularly struggle with that. And I think partially because they're growing up in a society where they never have to experience loss or defeat or failure because society's trying to shelter them from any kind of defeat or loss or failure and so they get older and they don't know how to fight it because they never had to and i think it's right. better to learn those lessons when you're young i think i heard you say before the podcast you told your daughter some things I want you to fail now because yeah. the best time of your life to fail is before yeah. you have kids and family and, you fail know, when it doesn't matter. And overhead and responsibilities. Yeah. You know, because in year 20, you can go live in mom and dad's basement and you'll be OK. But when Sydney, you have, you know, that's not true. Right. <laughs> but when you have <laughs> six kids, like I can't call my dad and be like, hey, dad, you got, yeah, so, you know, got eight, some eight extra rooms, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's an important lesson for everyone to learn yeah. that <clears throat> along the way, there's going to be those difficult times and understanding who you are and what you were meant to do and what your purpose is and pushing towards that and pushing through those setbacks. And so. how you show up, Randy Bixby, how you show up in yeah. anything is how you show up in everything, right? Mm -hmm. So through that process, would I work to uh, find my own purpose or would I continue to focus on what left me, what was behind me, or would I be present in mm -hmm. what was happening now? And so many people stay stuck in the fear mm -hmm. of what they might have missed out on or what might happen up here. Mm -hmm. And it is so important to be here. Mm -hmm. This space and time, this moment, this opportunity. And for me, in the process of losing so much, I lost my income, my business, my husband was unemployed, and every single thing I had trust in disappeared. Right. And, but my hope was anchored in something so much different. And when that was there, even in the mist, like you said, it did, it doesn't make it that it's just easy then, right. but it made it possible right. to not focus on myself. Exactly. 
And, and there's a verse in the Bible that comes to mind. It says, when I am weak, then am I strong. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think God wants us to be at a place of weakness and vulnerability, not so that we can't be powerful or not so that we can't be, you know, winners and accomplishers or victorious, but he wants us to be weak so that we then trust in him. So that he because gets the glory exactly. for his namesake, exactly. not mine. Exactly. Because in, in and of our own, so everything good about us is from him. Mm-hmm. So understanding that and allowing him to work through us is always going to be a better solution. And I understand that some of you listening today, maybe you're not a Christian or a believer and you think, well, that doesn't apply to me. And I would say it does, it does. apply to you. And everybody was put on this earth for a God-given reason. And so you got to start there. To me, that's, that's part one is just kind of figure out what you were meant to do. Yeah. You know? What were you, what were you born for? Because right. we were all made for something. For something. Absolutely. Yeah. So now today you're working in your, you have the city suite salon. You work alongside of a lot of different mm. gals and guys uh, doing kind of fulfilling their own dreams and you're getting to see them do that. And then you have your own little niche thing that mm-hmm. you focus on doing exactly what you love. Mm-hmm. You don't have to focus on all the little things that aren't as fun and I think that's a place that every entrepreneur wants to get so what do you love most about what you do today and what you do now and where you're at in this season oh shoot so forever I thought it was having all these employees and Mm -hmm. and being all these things and training stylists and uh, what I love now and what I believe I was made for and always made for and so all of it's part of it all that I've learned and come to But it is really being able to, and what I can do in my suite that I couldn't do, multitasking as a salon owner and all the things I was doing there is to be able to just focus. And I do focus on curly hair. I have straight haired guests who I love. If you're watching this, I (laughs) love you. Um, But I don't take new straight hair guests, just curly hair, because there is a misconception and many, many curly girls and boys um, have had that moment that they remember of the time that someone made fun of them yeah. for their hair. Like mine was, uh, what you get your finger caught in an electrical socket. <laughs> and so every time I wore my hair curly, yeah. that's what I saw. Yeah. And that's what I heard. Yeah. It I'm becomes 30- your persona. Yeah. So breaking that and allowing women. And I take um, pictures of women after every time I do their hair with these fancy lights and all the things. Uh, to post on my social media, but mostly I always say, you remember them glamour studio pics, girl, you're looking (laughs) good. You want them to feel something that no one ever validated. Sure. You are so beautiful. So that's what I do all day long. Like that's my job. I need to bring my son by. He's 13 or 14. He's curly hair. He wants to wear it short, but then it just doesn't look right. It doesn't ever come. We can't figure yeah, out. I can't teach him. I just don't know what the best hairstyle for him to have. We're trying to figure out all these. He's tried all these different hairstyles and nothing he's happy with. And so maybe you could just give some advice as to what his hair should, how he should cut it. Or I don't Maybe your husband would. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. maybe he should see yeah. boss, the big daddy boss. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> I yeah. only do the ladies. Yeah. Because if a boy, so my daughter's boyfriend has long curly hair and I always tell him Andrew if you put as much time into what I teach these women you will not be liked by women because it's (laughs) too much pressure you know (laughs) too much all right so thank you for sharing that journey with us by the way I appreciate that you know a lot of people don't like to get into the details and I think that will really be a help and an inspiration to somebody listening Um, but but from the first time I met you like I mentioned there's always been from my perception as long as I've known Casey Voss yeah there's been this confidence, this this sense of security in who you are. I've never seen you try to be something else or someone else. You, My perception of you always, and I feel like I'm a very perceptive person when it comes to people. I felt like you've always been very comfortable in your own skin. I just That's how I've perceived you. And I don't know what's going on in the inside. Nobody does, but you've always wore it well to me. So where do you think that comes from, especially from someone who struggled at such an early age? Where do you find that strength and that kind of, uh, you know, sense of security? Self, self, uh, esteem is something that is a lot of people struggle with. Mm -hmm. So where do you think you find that sense of who you are and being comfortable with that? Uh, well, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And, uh, I know that sounds easy, but my dad left on Christmas Eve when I was 13 and, didn't look back for a very long time Mm -hmm. and the hole that that left in my heart for my uh just perception of my worth and value 
and seeing myself was totally wrecked, right? And then proceeded to make a series of life choices, like I said, like, what do I have to do to make you like me? Because I will be that. Yep. And then um, I had a daughter at 19, and even the church shunned me. And all the things that you would think should welcome you, now I was an outcast everywhere, Mm -hmm. too, is what I felt. And I'll never forget it. I cry every time I tell the story, but I knew when I got pregnant that I desired a goodness for my daughter that I did not have. Mm. And um, I remember thinking the whole time I was pregnant, like, I'm going to do something so good here for you. And I'm going to take you to church and I'm going to teach you about God because I know that he's good. But I've done so many things that I cannot be good, but you can. Mm. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And so the whole time I was pregnant, because I had been such a mess before, I prayed for that, for her, and it was the, they brought her to me and put her in my arms in the hospital, and it was the first time I really felt the presence of the Lord so strongly, Mm -hmm. and I heard him say, it wasn't the voice of the church or the people of the church, Mm -hmm. or all the things around me, my failures, my lack of a father, my inability to measure up. He said, I love you like this. Hmm. Wow. And it changed my life. Yeah. And it changed the way that I showed up. And I got this tattoo. And um, it says, daughter of the king. And now it just looks like a burn. All my clients think I've been burned. <laughs> um, but what it did is it, for me, for the first time, I had an identity that wasn't my father. Yeah. It wasn't my past. It wasn't what he left behind. I wasn't somebody's leftovers. I was somebody's plan yeah and it took a long time and a lot of things but the book that i'm writing is based off of psalms 139 and it is the premise of where can i go and where have i been that you do not see me and love me and then further than that that you knew me before you formed me so if i believe that to be the truth right then nothing that's happened to me is a mistake it was a mistake it's a plan you have got me so if you have got me oh boy you better get fired up because i know that even in this season i am ready and so it's taken a long time and i think it took all the failures because my hope was in people and Mm -hmm. when those people left me my value was gone but god brought to me in every season of my life where something has been what i thought taken it was being restored Mm -hmm. and so I appreciate that you see that in me, Mm -hmm. but it is so that my identity is so wrapped in the cross and that my dad loves me so that he planned this life for me, this moment. And so that is honestly, and I don't waver in that. I'm Mm -hmm. so steady in that, that Mm -hmm. even when the suck is heavy, (laughs) because the suck is heavy. Oh, sure it is. And even when I don't know, I'm like, my daddy has got me yeah and he likes me like he yeah. likes my hair and i know it seems silly <laughs> but he likes it and he made it and even when it's frizzy he's like girl i got a plan for you yeah do you yeah. see you because i see you and yeah. where can i go that he doesn't see me so i don't have to hide who i am because i believe that he sees me yeah so I think that's that, how i get it that is fantastic and that kind of sense of security really can't come from anything mm-hmm. or anywhere else and again, I think it's such, it's such an anomaly today, I think, for someone to feel that strongly about who they are, why they are, and where they're going. And again, I think people read all kinds of self-help books. They listen to podcasts. They uh, watch inspirational videos or talk to counselors and try to find that purpose or, or who they are or what they are and be comfortable with it. And I know from experience as well that that kind of security can only be found in Christ. And uh, so, again, you know, thank you for sharing that with Mm -hmm. us and with our audience. And I know that's really raw and really real. But uh, to me, I mean, I can't add anything to that. That's just fantastic. And so I appreciate you sharing that. Um, And so I know that my perception of you, again, is this authenticity that you bring to the table that I don't see you trying to put on this facade. One of the reasons I'll be honest with you, go back to BNI. 
why I don't personally like going to networking events. This is a, and this is why Brenda, who you know, works for us, she goes to all of my networking events. Because I feel like I'm good at schmoozing. I know how to do it, but I don't enjoy it. And I feel like in a lot of the environments you go to where it's networking, where you're just meeting other business people, it's all about just measuring. Like everyone's talking about all how great they are and you got to kind of keep up and it's all this comparison. And I know that's not how it is at everyone, but that's my perception. And I feel like so many people are just giving you this pitch of who they are and what they do. And it's just not real to me. A lot of it, like a huge percentage. So I just don't go to them. Mm -hmm. And maybe that sounds like a cop out or an excuse, but that's just how I feel. Um, I like being around people that are real and authentic and, and are just being open about who they are. Now, again, we do marketing. So I understand that part of marketing is you want to make a business look as good and prosperous and as healthy as you can make it look. You don't market on your Instagram page that, well, cash flow is a little low this week, so we really need you to come in and buy some chocolate ice cream from some us. Some people know? do. Quit. Yeah, yeah, Quit. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I understand the whole process of wanting to give the perception that things are going fine and, and things are well. But um, <clears throat> I think so many people lack authenticity today. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you agree with that? I think they don't know authenticity. I yeah. think they've been filtered through a, an Instagram lens. Instagram filter. That yeah. <laughs> is, um, today was the first time I posted a video and I used the filter. God, those are good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I usually try to not even filter my pictures uh, because of that exact reason. And I try to share yeah. almost anytime I make a personal post, it's about a struggle. Because the truth is, if you're without struggle, uh, that's part of you playing the blind game and mm. sitting on the bench. Like you're choosing to sit out of the game because if you're really playing, right, you're, you're going to get hit. You're struggling. Yeah. You're going to get hit. And guess what? It's super fun to get dirty. Yeah. It's fun to get out there, but it's hard. Yeah. And you worry what people say. And that I think is the biggest thing. I watched that with my ninth grader just the other day came home and was struggling in math. And I said, well, let's go to the teacher and her instant reaction to me was I'm going to feel so stupid I don't want to do that and we had a long conversation about honey mm -hmm. this is how you play life right real life right is when you don't go just to your buddies instead of shielding him from that you yeah help you just through go it. in go yeah. ask the teacher it's not stupid stupid is not doing it right. like continuing right. to get an A in the class because your buddy helped you but you didn't super get it like just get it because right. it will help you exactly like I'm not afraid to say I don't yeah. get it yeah well and so many people are there though I mean we we, we see that evidently in teenagers junior high oh, for sure. freshmen so I mean they're really trying to like you know I've uh, had the opportunity to preach and teach young children and then teenagers and now I teach the young adults at our church I was a youth pastor for a couple years and, you know, I've spoke to large audiences. I was a pastor for seven years. So to me, the hardest group to speak to or preach to is teenagers because they're not allowed to laugh unless the other kids laugh or they're not allowed to be interested in something unless everybody else. That's such a real thing in that age group. But yeah, I think it's even real in adulthood. And maybe as you get older, you learn how to disguise it a little bit better. But I think people really, really struggle with that. And people struggle to be authentic because they look around and see everybody else and they compare themselves to everybody else and they want to be what somebody else is. They don't want to be unique. Even though they might say they want to be, they don't want to be, they don't want to stand out. And so I know we've talked a lot about authenticity as an individual, which I think is of paramount importance. But why do you think authenticity is also important in the life of a business owner or an entrepreneur, a lot of our audience is entrepreneurs and business owners. Why do you think as a business owner yourself that authenticity is so vital to running a company and, and, and relating to your customers? Sure, so I think that understanding who you are is first and foremost. So in the beginning of my business, I think I would have only said what was going well. Yeah. And I would have let you paint the picture yeah. of what you thought about me. Now, what happens when I do that is that when your picture no longer says I'm good, away goes all of my things. Right. So now being able to share, because do you know who Brene Brown is? I don't think so. Oh, God, game changer. But she talks <laughs> about um, one of my favorite quotes is, 
I understand that a big majority of the world lives in the spectator seats and mm. very few go into the arena. But the ones that are in the arena often take the opinion and the boos or the cheers from the spectators. Yeah. Now, why would you huh. take advice from those who do not play the game right. that you play? Right. So authenticity is saying, I'm in the middle of the arena naked and this ain't good. Right. You know, this hair's frizzy, this body, yeah. I got three kids, you know, yeah. and, and you're all looking at me wanting something. And right. what I'm going to say to you is I know nothing. Right. And so being willing to be unafraid, right. I think is the most often authentic thing you can be. And in business, being able to say, I don't really know, like, my social media, I'm just learning. I probably should have had some consistency in my Instagram pictures. So if you start following me the last two weeks, I'm getting better. Yeah. And I'm like, I should post a quote. Yeah. And learning. But it's really about saying, I don't know, because right. that's how you grow. And I think when you're listening for your realness to come from the crowd, mm -hmm. then you see failure. Absolutely. But I don't see, when I look back, I see a journey yeah. that has yeah. led me to this moment. The that broken is, road. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. rascal flats. Yeah. <laughs> you know, thank you, yeah. rascal. Yeah. And just what does it mean that we get to be here? Yeah. And there was a day not long ago that I laid on my mom's couch, pulled in her driveway. They had to pull me out. Yeah. Broken. Yeah. Because my identity was wrapped in something else. Mm -hmm. And my biggest fear now is to ever be her again. Yeah. Like I refuse. Right. And I love anyone who's come in my path. And I think that's the big thing too is being authentic means that that there I've had over 40 50 people that have worked for me in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And some people would say, "Oh god, well look at all the people that don't work for you now." Right. Sure? Right. Beep, 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 right. Rude. <laughs> uh what I'm going to tell you is I see all those women this is part of my name, flourishing. Yeah. So many places. Right. And, and that feel, is yeah. from part of what I've been a part of in their lives and Absolutely. what they've done in mine. Yeah. And so you don't have to hate people that move on in your life. I don't hate my dad. Right. I super love my real dad, like super love him. Yeah. And love what I, I learned to lean on my heavenly father from the loss of my earthly one. Yeah. Often we stay stuck in that too. Yep. Like, I think it's just saying like, none of it has the biggest value. None of it. Right. And so I hope that answered the Absolutely. question, but I think it's just like, it doesn't matter. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, going back to what you said about being in the arena, I think for me, and this is one of the things I talk about with my staff all the time, like I like to get behind and support anyone that's trying to do something. Yes. And I know young people that are trying these ideas and business and I don't have I don't understand it I don't get it but I'm like yeah just I'm glad that you're trying something because to me there's something to be said for someone that's willing to walk into the arena and, and be willing to get booed at and be willing to get thrown at things at and mocked and, and you better expect it absolutely. if you're going in for the first it's time it's gonna happen you're gonna lose an arm buddy but I get you know and it, my Zach uh, behind the camera here we talk about it all the time like I will support anyone that I see really trying to do something and everyone doesn't have to get it and I don't have to get it you just go do it. And, and uh, so I think that's awesome. But I think, not that I think, I know so many people struggle with what we're talking about, Casey. So it's many. so real. I mean, if I talk to 10 people, probably eight or nine of them struggle with this. This, this, this fear of being just, just who they are. Or, or, or maybe they have this idea, this great business idea in their mind. It's great. But they're afraid to talk about it because ah, they're going to think it's stupid. Or it just is, it's a pipe dream. Or I could never do that. What if it fails? How can what I? What if it fails? Absolutely. Even though everything you read says, don't worry about failure. It's part of it. And I don't think that anybody listening would disagree with anything we've said. But yet they still are in that place. So why do you think that so many people struggle with this idea of being authentic, being themselves? So um, there's a psychology term called simply, it's called mirror, mirror. And I think it's the idea that we project our own insecurities on those around us. So mm. really whatever you're feeling or thinking about someone else is legit what you got going on in your yeah. own heart. So right. your judgment, it, the reason you're afraid is mm -hmm. because you've watched, and that's what I said about taking the advice from the spectator. Not yeah. that it's wrong necessarily, 
uh, but it doesn't have a place at my table. Right. Because there was a point in my career that looked really successful that everyone else could look at and say, this is super successful, but I knew it wasn't. Right. And so knowing your measure and knowing what you're gauging to get there. And I think that being able to say that whatever you're doing and wherever you're going has to be, like you said, driven with a purpose. And people are afraid to play because what if it fails Mm -hmm. because they've watched other people what they think have failed and i'll tell you when we opened city suites i got a letter jamie and i got a letter nasty mean letter like who does this (laughs) who were you it was not (laughs) nice but we got a letter that said um something on the lines of because people will chatter small town big town i hate when people say well in a people right people do it everywhere yes not just people talk everywhere you hear more of it because you know more people here but um you're so greedy. This wasn't going to work before. I can't believe you think this is going to work now. And I'll tell you, I'm so glad God told us three years it would take to fill that place. Three years. And I told everybody, right? One year in, we had one renter. 19 suites, one renter. I'm like, <laughs> I'm getting hot. And this letter said, how dare you? Yeah. You know, you've walked all over these people. You're so greedy, all you want. And I can see why that narrative, because I didn't have one. Right. Because my voice wasn't out there. Right. So it was made. And um, I could have allowed that to make me bitter Mm -hmm. and want to just spew back. Or you could have believed it. Or I could have believed it. I could have owned it. I tried for a minute. I'm like, are we? Do I not see it? Lord, fix me. Shoot me. Like, what did I do? Like, why do people think this? Mm -hmm. Bam, bam, bam. And then I said, no, it's not me. But I don't have to vindicate myself. And I think often we feel like we have to justify Mm -hmm. ourselves Mm -hmm. I don't have to because as I said in Psalms 139 if you're not a Christian just read it because it's good uh I can't go anywhere where he doesn't see me and I'm asking him to to check me engage me um but two years in we had three renters and one of them came and visited and said well I didn't want to come for the first year because a lot of people told me you guys fail at a lot of businesses oh geez (laughs) Yuck. And hard, I thought, hard swallow. <laughs> yeah, but I can see again. But those same people that told you that I failed at a lot of businesses probably were people that were like, I love going to that salon. I love yeah. it. You know, at one point had been. And so what happened was I think they lost their sense of community because they loved hair piece. Mm-hmm. They loved all the girls there. I loved all the girls there. Yeah. And I think when that fell apart, people own your business a little bit. And that's oh, yeah. kind of what we want, especially yeah. in a social media world. Yeah. I want you to own a piece of what I'm creating. And so when that falls apart, I think people feel something and so they flash out whatever it is they're feeling and so it becomes that and then like i said so flash forward three years later almost three years to the day we signed the lease on the last the 19th suite but at the to make 19 full i had to close one dream so another salon closed in order to fill but what i see so someone could look at that and say you failed again but i look at it and go God, yeah. you are just whittling away all the things. You're <laughs> yeah. just a whittler. And yeah. and what I'm doing now, I never thought. I said when we built City Suites, people would ask me, I said, I would never work anywhere like that. I love mm-hmm. this. I love mm-hmm. being with people. I love doing that. Right. But guess what? After that, God showed me all the other things. I'm writing this book, me. I'm writing this book. And from my editor in that book, she just gave me two jobs. I started writing for this other book and got two of my pieces paid for. Wow. And I'm a girl, I don't even know what an adjective is, right. legitimately. <laughs> I do not know what a noun is, like a person, place, or thing, maybe, I don't know. And I'm writing, and what I see in that is that when you just say yes, God, like whatever it is, and I don't care what everyone else is saying out here because I'm just going to do what you called me to. And, and not that this stuff failed, it formed me. Mm-hmm. It formed me. Mm-hmm. It was part of me. And that's real. Mm-hmm. And I think people, I love my clients so much, and I think my clients love me too and I think it's because they see me like one of my favorite things I spoke at the Lincoln High graduation that was my favorite thing I've ever done in my life because in those kids I saw myself yeah and the greatest thing you can give to other people is where you can go where someone wasn't for you right and say man you're not alone right I see you right and you can go anywhere like really Dr. Seuss knew (laughs) all the places you will go you can go yeah but you have to, it has to come here and it can't come from, I got enough lights. I got enough people comment because someday they'll quit commenting. Right. It has to come from in here 
And when that does it, you know, you want to go to Fitness Coliseum because it's awesome, but mm -hmm. that's not going to make me better. Right. When my jeans look better. Right. You know, because I already know that I know that I know who yeah. I am and whose I am. Yeah. So that's authenticity is it's just knowing. It's just knowing. Yeah. Well, again, I think there are so many fears that people have. Um, and we can get into probably a whole rabbit hole of list of things that people are afraid of. Let's do that but, sometime. But yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think we'll hit on it with this next thing that, that I want to talk about um, because we manage social media here at our company. So we're very up to date on what's new with social media. What are the trends? And social media has a lot of positive, but there's a whole lot of negative that can come along with it. And so I want to talk about and I want to get your perspective on how you think social media has positively or negatively affected people's ability to just be themselves and be who they are and particularly for you know the individual i think is pretty self-evident even though i think we should t touch on it but particularly to business owners why are they so afraid you said you when you share you talk about struggles so few people are even willing to do that i know here at az you know we represent at any given time between 75 and 100 companies and so our job is to make those companies look good mm -hmm. Now we don't know everything that's going on there because we don't work there but we we've helped create their website and their brand and their social media we know their products and so we're trying to make those products and brands and services look as good as possible and we try to partner with the right people so that we're not just putting lipstick on a pig we partner with people who we believe in their vision we believe in their integrity we believe in their character we believe in their product all of that stuff but there have been times where we've gone into companies and we're like, we're not promoting this right. This is not good. And we've had to separate uh, once or twice because of that reason. Of course, we have conversations with them first. But um, I know here at AZ, because we're so adamantly trying to make everybody look the right way and have the right perception on social media, it's something that we here are trying to do. And even here, I would say there have been times where we're having struggles that I've been personally, you know, I don't want our clients to find out about that. I don't want people to know that, you know, we really barely met payroll this week or, you know, we, we had to pay the rent two weeks late because we were waiting on cash from somebody else. Those are real things that happen in a small so business. say all those, yeah. like you're say all those, like, yeah. that's what I think what we should say. Like, yeah. Hey, live this week on our podcast, we're struggling. <laughs> right. You know, like, why? We might close the doors next week. <laughs> well, I probably want to do that. That's weird. False alarms out of nowhere. Right. right. But, like, the real of the struggle yeah. is, I think, pe people are hungry for it. Because when they get on here, so here's what happens. I'm struggling. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. I'm going to pick up my phone and scroll right. it. I'm not going to let myself feel bad. No, I'm going to find some way to just scroll it out. And what I'll say about social media really quick is in my research for writing my book, I was like, when did this identity shift? Is it social media? And what I found is in the 1800s, women were um, painting their faces with lead-based paint. You know, you see these mm -hmm. pictures of these women in these elegant ball gowns, yeah. white face. Mm -hmm. um, well, we know lead paint is poisonous, right? Yeah. So it made their eyebrows fall out. Okay, they were dying. And then they would use rat pellets to glue their eyebrows Sheesh. for eyebrows because that was a sign of beauty. And so long before these <laughs> gal darn things showed up, this has intensified it. But yeah. long before that, the search for authenticity, the search for who am I, we live personally, I'm going to talk in a hair arena uh, we live in the first time in history. I was born for this. Mm -hmm. The first time in history that you're going to look at a yearbook, if anyone even looks at those, and not know what the trend was. Right. Because it's what you are. We're dying. We're right. busting at the seams to figure out who we are. Right. 80s, boom, everyone, the bang yeah. was it. 90s, yeah. flattened it down the middle. Yeah. You know, the 50s, <laughs> boom, boom. You know, like yeah. every generation, the 1800s, always till now, who are you? is beckoning from the yeah. boardroom to the from the schoolroom everywhere people are saying who am i and then yeah. what's happening is when i start feeling who i am mm -hmm. i better check out because i don't know how to deal with right. me i don't know who me is so i better start looking maybe if my house looks more like this maybe if my car looks more like this mm -hmm. i'm going to be more like this fomo I, I have to work really hard to put this away yeah. and say to myself like that is not me right and you know, I bought these earrings that I'm wearing at uh, 
this really kitschy Salvation Army in Chicago when we took Sydney to school. And my husband was like, are you going to wear those? (laughs) I'm like, am I going to wear them? I'm going to own them. You know, like someone else, this is the thing. Someone else bought these earrings and probably never wore them because they were like, oh, I wish I could. Yeah. I just think there's stuff all around you that people are wishing. And if you can come alongside somebody, and this is what I think is the most real, and this is what you're doing, hopefully. um, And what I want to do is see it. Mm -hmm. I want to see you. So I want to see what you're doing and I want to speak out what's good in you. And then I want to encourage your uniqueness exactly where it's at. Yeah. And I want people to be able to resonate. I just said that on a video I made today. Um, What makes a great haircut is not because I'm the best haircutter in the world and I can see you and tell you what's going to make your face look good. Mm -hmm. What makes a great haircut is that I hear what you're telling me about what makes you feel good in your hair. And I can make that better because how you see you is way more important For than sure. how I see you. Yeah, because tomorrow you'll wake up and the hair might not look the same, but you got to be comfortable with what's you inside. you got to see it. So I want to hit on something that you just mm-hmm. talked about. You know, we're talking about social media and where people, they grab the phone because they're afraid to just be alone for a minute or to feel. So they don't allow themselves time to process those feelings or to even think about being alone or sad. they got to turn that on quickly and forget about it. And what happens is it intensifies everything that they felt about themselves because people don't post like we just talked about people don't post on social media the bad things they're posting all the best things their best trip their best car their best day their best new haircut their best you know new relationship so not only were you feeling bad about your day or yourself or your relationship now you get to see everybody else that you know or that you perceive that you know is having all these good things happening to them and so now you're like i'm really doing something wrong I'm really just missing the boat. I'm, f- I'm, I'm failing. Everyone around me is succeeding and I myself am just misery. I'm in, I'm doing everything wrong. And I think that if people could take the time when they're feeling that bad kind of way, that certain kind of way that they just intentionally don't pick that up. That's the worst time to go to Facebook or Instagram, but just allow yourself to be alone. In my situation as a Christian, I'm going to stop and pray, ask God to, give me wisdom show me what i need to do show me but i think that people have so much access to information about everybody else i mean when's the last time we saw each other face to face it's been a while but we both know things about each other based on what we've been posting on social media i just took my daughter to college and we took a little road trip and it's amazing how many people i've seen that i haven't seen in long oh it looks like you had a good trip (laughs) like So we have all this access to everyone else's information. And so now we're almost forcing ourselves to compare ourselves. Again, I go back to the Bible. There's a verse that says comparing yourselves amongst yourself is unwise because that's not the ju- that's not the measure. That's not the level. Your success does not define my success. My success doesn't define yours. My ability to interact in a situation isn't the same as yours. My purpose isn't the same as yours. But yet so many people are comparing themselves. Uh, hairdresser in Owasso trying to make it might be looking at Casey Voss and saying I'm never going to be that I'm not going to be able to do that and so you being vulnerable and sharing your story might help her Mm -hmm. but I really think that if you're listening and every time you get on social media it causes you to feel worse about yourself or feel like you're missing out on something or feel like you're behind everybody else or feel like you're missing the boat I really encourage you to cancel your accounts or to take a fast, take a time away from it because it's not worth it. It's not worth it. If you can't look at that and be happy for everybody else, like I see other people getting to do, I genuinely feel like, oh, that's awesome. They they get to do that. I don't at this stage in my life feel a jealousy towards Mm -hmm. other people or to feel like they're doing something more than me, but I think it's real. So my encouragement would be if that's the case, just put it away. You don't have to have it. Yeah, what, what so are your thoughts on that? My encouragement for young people and to old people alike is I always say, don't do the roll and scroll. Your beginning of your day belongs to you. I say JC, but that's up to you if you choose him. Um, but setting your intentions. I'm huge on intentions. Mm-hmm. I Brendan Bruchard, uh, High Performance Habits, one of my favorite books. But mm-hmm. um, he talks about the power morning. And, um, you know, I want to start my day not based on everyone else's agenda. Mm -hmm. What does God have for me this day? 
how do I want to show up in it? The power of intention. My alarm goes off three times a day, so I try <laughs> to use this for good too. Right. Three times a day with three words. Joyful, present, transparent. It goes off at 6.30 in the morning, 12.30 in the afternoon, and 6.30 at night. Why? Because I want in the middle of my morning to remember, in the middle of my work day when I'm kind of bogged out or <laughs> things are feeling overwhelming, who do I want to be? I want to bring joy. I want to be present. And uh, I did fast from social media back... Uh, April and I never came back on my personal page Mm -hmm. only on Voss the Curl Boss and so although it's still there I think I've shared a sermon or two on there Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm really not a preacher like that so I try not to do that but if something strikes my soul and says oh shoot gotta get after it for sure Um, but I didn't come back for that reason because here's the thing Um, and I posted about this yesterday on my my, I decided then that my work page would be a, a source of encouragement only Mm -hmm. it would be a source of authentic truth Mm -hmm. so you might see a beautiful picture of my family but i guarantee the story underneath of it says we suck today yeah this is what i did i totally messed up totally failed but guess what in that i sat down had a conversation with my kids that my parents never had with me they didn't know how because from glory to glory so the word tells us that we'll transfer from glory to glory Mm -hmm. and what does glory mean it means more authentic and more authentic that's what Mm -hmm. the translation of that word means Mm -hmm. what's authentic created by your purpose what is your purpose now there's the question and when you know the answer to that question you just keep getting more real and more real and the noise outside and the pictures like i'll get caught up in it rachel hollis who i love just bought a dress on like bop bow or something and she's like check it out and i checked it out it was like six hundred dollars i thought who checks this out and buys this and then i kind of was like "Ooh, guess what I'm going to buy it. Yeah. And then I'm like, who are you kidding? Right, right. Like, I didn't buy it. Don't, yeah. I don't want to hear anything. I didn't buy it. But if you're doing <laughs> no that, hate mail. yeah. And that makes you think like, holy smokes. Like I just, I deserve that. The word yeah. I deserve whenever yeah. that pops into my heart, <laughs> right. you know what I deserve? Yeah. That's exactly the life I'm living. Yeah. Exactly the moment I'm in mm-hmm. with gratitude and openness and honesty. That's what we deserve. And so I think, people get onto social media and they just want to be something they're not because Mm -hmm. they don't. I think when the things push up and that's, I'm promoting a book that is not, maybe will never even come to fruition, but God gave it to me. And each chapter of the book um, shares a personal memory of my past, how that, how that ended up showing up in my life and how that, remember when we were kids, you could do the pick the ending of your Mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. So each chapter is a call to action for you. Will you remember what brought that to you and will you exchange the lie for the truth and if so here is how we can break that chain because when you know who you are when you know that you know that you know you may get caught up in the roll and the scroll but you are really your purpose becomes to serve others instead of to be served Mm. and to be liked and yeah. to be shared. Right. And you just, I'd rather have, like I said, a thousand authentic followers who are like, I really think that Casey's content is awesome versus 10,000 followers who are DM me all the time for dumb stuff. I ain't yeah. got time for dumb stuff. Ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> I got three kids, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, I think I, I'd like to ask the question this way. As somebody who's been on both sides of the spectrum, and I want our audience to be clear, I think I can speak for Casey and, and for myself here that even when you appear to have it all together, there's still stuff going on on the inside. Like you don't know if I, if I used to tell my staff, like on the days you see me when I worked in hotels, I said on the days you see me being like the most like enthusiastic, jolly, you know, joking around and just being outwardly like overtly enthusiastic intentionally, it's probably because I'm having a really bad day. And on those days I choose, I'm not going to let it get me. So I said, those are the days that I'm probably, and, and I think, you know, people know how to put the mask on, but as, and I think you should sometimes, I think sometimes you just need to be strong and push through it. But I think as someone who's been on both sides where you just felt alone, there's nobody there for me. There's nothing out there for me. I don't identify with anybody as to a person now who has learned along the way that I, not only is God in my corner, but he put me in this corner and he am supposed to be here and he's working through me intentionally every day. What would you say is a good first step for somebody out there listening? Says, I, I want to get there. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It, it's an ongoing work. We're working on it every single day. But I want to get there. I want to find my true self. 
What's a good first step for someone to take? So at church, I'm part of the teaching team at church. I'm not a pastor. Mm -hmm. I'm just a lady girl. Um, But uh, we did this series um, that was so good. And it was, I ended up calling it uh, Living in the Candy Corn. (laughs) And um, it was these three spheres. And one is personal. So inside the personal sphere, if we go too far into that, we're going to get selfish. Right. And then over here is a sphere, which is body or church community, if you're mm-hmm. not a church guy. And if you get too far into that, you become a hypocrite. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at everybody like yeah. you should do. Mm-hmm. And then there's the world down here, right? And mm-hmm. if you get too far into the world, darkness yeah. kind of exists. Yeah. And so I learned inside of that, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. So when, <laughs> when I'm feeling selfish, I realize I'm too far out on my own. Yeah. When I'm feeling hypocritical, I'm too high on my horse. Yeah. And when I'm feeling dark, so it's living. So when those three s- s- sectors light up, <laughs> right. we highlighted orange and yellow. Yellow is when the, the sweetest spot is when all of those together mesh into the world. So find a tribe. Yeah. Find a tribe and find a purpose and then take it out into the world. Hmm. And so that's where the, the highlighted areas are for me. And I'm so quick to, because I am a self-help, like I read all the books, I listen to all the podcasts. <laughs> I love uh, Josh Adams, who's one of my besties. Uh, he says, I collect uh, pastor cards. If you could collect them, like you yeah. could collect baseball cards. Like, uh, <laughs> I, but I try to stay in the center yeah. of, so I say community is important. Find people that know you well enough to know when you're not well yeah and then live your life out loud in the world transparently don't be all church all right don't be all self and don't be all world yeah just mix it up it's an excellent balance yeah excellent living balance. the life living the candy corn folks yeah and a good shout out to i believe it was flavor Flav with the check yourself <laughs> before you I, gotta I check think. yourself before you wreck yourself <laughs> Shout out to some 90s hip hop. Yeah. <clears throat> so at the end of it all, we could talk about this for hours. And if you're still listening, thank you. I hope this has been beneficial to you. And I'm, I'm certain that it will be. Um, but at the end of it all, what does success look like to Casey Voss? Uh, balance. It is balance. And it is constantly, uh, for me, I've lived in so many arenas. The business arena, the uh out there arena the money arena all of it my biggest arena is at home in my home and a lot of pastors or church people or business people die Uh, seven habits of highly effective people i read all the books uh, Mm -hmm. starting with the end in mind he says if you were at your funeral with the people you love the most know what you think about them (laughs) and my answer when i read that book was absolutely not because all the things i was building and dreaming about were for them but i was exhausted by the time i got to them and shoot man i was working hard so you could have stuff but man you didn't appreciate it and i was always upset so for me success is that the people closest to me, which is the hardest, those are the hardest ones to be mm-hmm. authentic mm-hmm. and love well. For sure. Uh, that they know Christ through me because they've witnessed me on my knees and being real. That's, that's success for me. Very good. And because of that, all the other things flow. Yeah. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Absolutely. And I always ask this question at the end of the podcast mm-hmm. to each of our guests. But what is your best piece of advice? Be here. Be so present that you are not. Most people are stuck. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to the Lord. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind. Mm. Worry comes from thinking about the past or obsessing about the future. Although that is important, be here things are happening here very very good well again thank you for being on our show today Uh, i I, like i said we could talk about this for hours and we might continue to talk after the podcast but i want to give you an opportunity to tell our audience how they can uh find casey voss the curl boss how they can find city suite salon and so let our audience know where they can find you on the internet well thanks this was so much fun so you can find me um I think you just let go YouTube or on Instagram and say Voss the Curl Boss. There's an underscore in there. I'm sure you'll figure it out. I don't know how. <laughs> Facebook is the same. Um, and City Suites, if you go on to www.citysuitesalonandspas.com, you'll find a directory for all of the amazing 
entrepreneurs that are housed in that space. And uh, don't call me for an appointment there because you have to call each individual person. But just go check that out. And uh, I hope that you learned something today. I know I did. Absolutely. And, and I want to say thank you because uh, this was an encouragement to me. Uh, you actually hit on some things that were very in the moment to me right now. And your story was encouraging and inspiring and uh, has helped give me some perspective that I didn't have. And I think it's going to really help me going into this next phase of my life. And so I want to say thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being real and authentic and vulnerable with us. So, so awesome. Thank <coughs> you for having me in the arena. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Thank yeah. you. And thank you for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed the podcast. I hope that you gleaned something from it. I hope that you were encouraged. But I want to encourage you to be real, to be yourself, to be authentic. And as Casey said, be here, be present. Again, thank you for joining us on the show today. As my mother always said, you can't and never could until you tried. So go out there and try something great, my friends, and don't take the easy way out. We'll see you next time. Cue the music. Cue the music.